April 26, 1986, the number four reactor at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, a power plant near the city of Pripyat in the northern region of Ukraine, underwent a meltdown. During a safety test meant to mimic a loss of power and major coolant leak event, the reactor's output was brought down to a near zero number. This, due in part to xenon poisoning, led to a positive scram inside the reactor. Neutron absorption dropped, reactor activity increased, coolant temperatures rose, steam explosions rocked the facility, and the reactor core of reactor number four melted. The core ruptured and destroyed the reactor building, spewing radioactive contaminants into the air. The nearby city of Pripyat, within viewing distance of the plant, evacuated its population of nearly 49,000 residents in the aftermath. In the following 36 hours, the Chernobyl nuclear power plant zone of alienation was created. Often referred to as the Chernobyl Exclusion Zone, the 30 kilometer zone, or simply the zone. Once in a blue moon, a game comes along that has such a profound impact on the gaming world that its influence is felt far and wide through countless titles across various genres and is still cited as inspiration by game designers long after its release. A game with brutal survival mechanics, with monstrous enemies lurking around every corner, with an omnipresent atmosphere core ingrained into its core premise, and with challenging levels that both frustrate and reward players who manage to overcome its many obstacles. A game known as Stalker. Developed by GSC Game World and published in 2007 by THQ, Stalker, Shadow of Chernobyl, released two underwhelming scores. Never rising above an 8.5 among game critics, that didn't stop fans all across the world from praising its challenging design, its ruined future aesthetic, and its intriguing plot. Players take control of an unknown man, simply known as the Marked One, as he travels into an anomalous region known as the Zone, in order to kill a man named Strelok. However, before we can dive into the premise, the mechanics, and the horror of Stalker, we must first travel all the way back to 1972. A philosophical science fiction novel by Soviet Russian authors Arkady and Boris Strugatsky, Roadside Picnic served as the root inspiration for the Stalker video game franchise, among various other media, such as stage plays, television series, films, and other video games. The book itself is broken up into four sections, each progressing the plot of the story over the course of eight years. It follows the protagonist Redrick Red Shuhart as he encounters increasingly anomalous events in an area known as The Zone. Roadside Picnic is set in the aftermath of an anomalous, assumed to be extraterrestrial event known as The Visitation. Six locations, all across the Earth, were assumed to have been visited by these aliens, creating these so-called zones that exhibit unexplainable phenomena. Governments across the globe attempted to restrict access to these anomalous areas, fearful of what might happen should the zones increase in size, or if objects are taken out of containment. Unfortunately for them, a unique subculture made up of individuals known as stalkers make a living off of traversing into these zones to steal artifacts for profit. Taking place in the fictional English-speaking city of Hormont, the story follows Red as he initially attempts to clean up his act, wanting to break free of his life as a stalker. However, in his new job as a lab assistant, he goes with his boss into the zone in search of artifacts, in hopes of advancing his boss's career. Unfortunately, the artifact ultimately leads to his boss and friend's death. Disillusioned with breaking free from his former habits, Red returns to his life as a stalker, and repeatedly ventures into the zone. Due to his consistent return to the zone, when Red and his wife have a child, she is born with mutations. Covered with blonde fur but maintaining her intellect, Red and his wife give her the nickname Monkey. After returning to his life as a stalker, Red encounters a substance known as Hell Slime in the zone. This slime, having acidic properties, dissolves the legs of another stalker known as the Vulture. Government contacts attempt to retrieve some of this Hell Slime from Red, but realizing it would be used for nefarious purposes, attempts to ward off their goal of obtaining the substance. However, Red eventually caves and turns over the house slime to the government, fully knowing it will be used as a weapon of mass destruction, but understands his wife and child need the money. 
He spends the next several years in jail. Many years down the line, Red is released from prison and returns home to find that his wife is wallowing in a deep depression and his daughter's humanity has been slowly stripped away, leading her to behave and resemble a monkey more and more over time. In addition, for reasons unknown to all, any dead buried in the zone prior to its creation have begun to rise, though are slow moving and entirely harmless, including Red's own father. After this, Red decides to venture into the zone one final time in order to reach a mystical object known as the Wishing Sphere. Red seeks out this magical sphere, capable of granting a person's wish in order to cure his daughter of the mutations he unintentionally cursed her with. Red embarks on his final journey into the zone, bringing with him the Vulture's son Arthur, as well as a map to the Golden Sphere given to him by the Vulture. In order to bypass the Golden Sphere's invisible force field known as the Meat Grinder, Red knowingly allows Arthur to stumble into it, brutally killing him as he wished for happiness for all people. Now standing before the Sphere, Red cannot articulate exactly what he wants and leaves it up to the Sphere itself to figure out his innermost wish inadvertently wishing for something left in him that would wish for something good. In the end, just like with Arthur, Red becomes obsessed, wishing for happiness for everybody, free, and may no one be left behind, until the meat grinder likely resets. The horror of Roadside Picnic focused primarily on the dangers of the zone and men's innermost desire. Red's fear while traversing the zone is palpable, with his anxiety and fight or flight rising with every near misstep, and despite his innate fear of the powers of the zone, he continues to return time and time again. Red treats the zone as a living entity, one capable of snuffing out a person for daring to mistreat it or for refusing to acknowledge its dangers. An omnipresent force, the zone itself decides who lives and who dies. Destroyed and decaying buildings, a barren wasteland of what used to be, and the memories of a life before haunt the entire landscape. Readers are also introduced to the horrifying effects of the zone through Monkey, noting her mutations and her mind's slow collapse as her modified DNA breaks down. The introduction of zombies rising from the dead also builds an otherworldly and supernatural aspect to the zone. This living entity capable of warping the laws of nature until nature becomes unrecognizable and alien. For the artifacts themselves, particularly the empties as the world refers to them as. These specific anomalies within the zone ingrain a sense of near-cosmic fear into the reader. At any point, if one isn't too careful, they can be rendered to ash, electrocuted to death, ripped to shreds by some gravitational force, or dissolved in otherworldly acid. And of course, none of this touches the alluring siren song of the wishing sphere somewhere in this anomalous zone, and the horrifying meat grinder that protects it tempting all who hear it with promises of the world. Lastly, the inherent selfishness and destructive capabilities of humanity are seen time and time again as they attempt to use the zone and its miracles for their own selfish gains. In the 50 years since Roadside Picnic's original publication, the story of the zone and the stalkers who roamed the anomalous wasteland has had wide-reaching influence. The term stalker became a neologism, a relatively recent term that has gained popularity or institutional recognition, embedding itself firmly into the Russian language. Stalker now refers to individuals who guide others through forbidden territories, urban explorers and industrial tourists, and those visiting abandoned sites, ghost towns, and off-limit locations. The term has also ingrained itself into the English language as well, with many people referring to themselves as stalkers for many of the same reasons. Other important concepts have found their way into other media. For instance, the zone itself is an anomalous area inspired several other stories indirectly, if not directly. M. John Harrison's 2007 novel, Nova Swing, features an area known as the Event Zone, where reality is distorted. Jeff Vandermeer's Annihilation, both the book and the film, feature a similar anomalous zone called Area X, supposedly caused by an extraterrestrial mutagenic force. Tales from the Loop, an Amazon Prime series, explores a similar premise as well in an Ohio town filled with strange artifacts and anomalies scattered across the rural area. So many stories have adapted this idea of an anomalous zone that it's hard to list them all. Roadside Picnic has been adapted and has been the source of inspiration for countless films, books, television shows, and video games over the years. 
1977, and now lost Czechoslovakian TV miniseries adapting the novel was broadcasted before being destroyed by Soviet censors. Star Control 2, a 1992 video game, references the visitation and alien visitors. A Finnish leader created a stage adaptation in 2003. An indie film called Vyohoke, or simply Zone, sought to adapt the original book. And of course, in 1979, Andrei Tarkovsky's Stalker, loosely based on Roadside Picnic, redefined the story of the Zone and set the stage for games like Stalker and many more. Andrei Tarkovsky's 1979 film Stalker, with screenplay by Roadside Picnic authors Arkady and Boris Strugotsky, explores a similar premise as Roadside Picnic. Many of the same concepts, such as the zone, a wishing sphere, alien visitations, anomalies, a stalker subculture, and the dangers of the zone are carried over into this film. However, what sets Stalker apart from its source material is less of a focus on the science fiction aspect, particularly the decay of human society, humanity's desire to use power beyond its understanding to destroy itself, and the effects of these powers on mankind, and instead focuses primarily on discussions of philosophy, the purpose of existence, man and nature, theology and the presence of a god, a higher authority and supernatural occurrences, and psychology, how the zone seems to sap away at the character's sanity the longer they remain. Much in the same way as Roadside Picnic, Stalker also sets up the zone as a character itself. Rather than simply being a location, the zone is repeatedly referred to as and depicted as its own living entity with an agenda beyond the comprehension of men who traverse within it. It is a living being, a cosmic force that shifts and rearranges of its own volition and punishes those who treat it with disrespect often with violent consequences. The anomalies it creates are more often alluded to through various corpses, burnt-out cars, disembodied voices, and glitches in space-time, rather than overtly witnessed. In this iteration as well, the premise follows a supernatural golden sphere, referred to simply as The Room, and appears to primarily adapt the first and last section of Roadside Picnic, that being Red's search for artifacts with his boss and his hunt for the golden sphere in the final section. The film follows three unnamed characters, referred to as the Stalker, the Writer, and the Professor. As they journey into the zone, each loosely representing Red, his peer Tender, and his boss Kirill respectively. The Stalker acts seemingly out of a selfless desire to help those wanting to reach the room. The Writer seeks inspiration for fear of losing it altogether and the professor wishes to study the anomalous properties of the zone. As the three men traverse through the zone, they encounter a number of hazards, though most of the anomalies are alluded to rather than visually seen. Along the way, they engage in various discussions on philosophy, theology, and their innermost desires, which makes up a bulk of the film's runtime. Tarkovsky spends a vast majority of the movie exploring these themes, and long shots of the characters sharing their beliefs and their motives for finding their room. By the time the three men reach their destination, the mythical room located inside an abandoned factory, all have shared their real reasons for seeking the room. The professor wanted to destroy the room outright, to ensure no man may use it for evil, but ultimately disassembles his bomb after a long verbal confrontation between himself, the stalker, and the writer. The writer realizes that a former stalker, known as Porcupine, successfully made it into the room, hoping to resurrect his dead brother. The room instead granted Porcupine's truest innermost desire, wealth. Out of guilt, Porcupine ends his own life. Because of this simple fact, the room cannot truly be used for selfish reasons, as a room knows what a person may not. Neither the writer, the professor, nor the stalker enter the room. <laughs> Взять жену, мартышку и перебраться сюда. Навсегда. Several concepts from Roadside Picnic were carried over into this loose adaptation. Stalkers, the zone, a place or object capable of granting wishes, references to powers beyond human understanding and extraterrestrial intervention, the presence of the protagonist's mutated child, referred to as monkey in both versions, 
and commentary on man's innermost desires. However, the concepts of retrieving anomalous artifacts, other anomalous zones, and many plot beats from the source material, such as the house line and the dead rising, are noticeably absent. Along with this, the source of the zone appears to lie within a meteor that crashed into the site many decades ago. The film also relocates the setting to Eastern Europe rather than a nondescript English-speaking location. Tarkovsky's stalker also shies away from the innate horror of the zone as depicted in Roadside Picnic. Gone are these visceral depictions of violence and death, such as Vulture's leg dissolving in House Line and Arthur being eviscerated in the meat grinder, and the depictions of the horrifying anomalies that stretch across the zone. Although anomalies are seen in the film, they are focused on and shown to a lower degree than the source material. Tarkovsky maintains Rad's deep-seated fear and respect for the zone to the stalker, with many of his character traits being carried over, though Rad's film counterpart appears much more skittish and consistently fearful. Overall, this iteration of the zone, while terrifying, pulls out the trio's innermost desires, their philosophical monologues, and the debates of the morality of man, and focuses less on the horrifying consequences of interacting with the zone. Despite all of these changes, Tarkovsky's version of the Zone and the Stalker's enthrallment inspired many others to create stories based around some kind of anomalous exclusion zone, including 2007's Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl. The Stalker franchise pulled heavily from both versions of the Zone, both from Roadside Picnic and from Tarkovsky's Stalker. GSC Gamrel set their version apart by including several more horror survival elements, placed the zone in then present day, and based it around the Chernobyl disaster of 1986. The game itself became a mixture of both versions of the zone, but appears to primarily pull from the original roadside picnic iteration, while also creating its own version of the world of Stalker. So, Mark One, I saved you, and I'm not going to pretend I did it to win favors upstairs. Stalker introduced recent generations to the dark and dangerous world of the zone. Similar to Tarkovsky's film, players take control of an unnamed man referred to as both Stalker and Marked One throughout the game. Marked by a Stalker tattoo and found alive out in the zone, this unnamed loner ventures through the zone in order to find another Stalker by the name of Strelok. Along the way, the Stalker encounters a few different factions, each with their own objective and purpose within the zone, can embark on side quests and missions, and journeys further into the zone in order to uncover why he needs to kill Strelok and what lies at the epicenter of the Zone of Alienation. Shadow of Chernobyl reimagines the lore of Roadside Picnic and Tarkovsky's Stalker to create a unique setting for the player to explore. The game is set in the year 2012, six years after an unknown secondary anomalous explosion occurred in the Chernobyl Exclusion Zone, creating what is referred to as the Zone of Alienation, or simply, the Zone. In this interim, a group known as Stalkers a backronym of scavenger, trespasser, adventurer, loner, killer, explorer, and robber, began infiltrating the zone in order to understand its anomalous properties, study the cosmic events, and seek out its hidden treasures for fame and fortune. Players awaken in a safe zone and are given a task to seek out and kill another stalker known as Strelok. Wandering across the zone, the stalker encounters strange artifacts that grant boosts with some drawbacks. Dangerous anomalies capable of tearing a person apart. Horrifying mutants roaming the wastelands. And warring factions all vying for control of the zone. The Stalker navigates these dangers, accepting small quests along the way in order to aid specific factions. In his quest to find and kill the aforementioned Strelok. Straylock and his men were the first to successfully reach the center of the zone, the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, locating a near-mythical monolith known as the Wish Granter, a structure capable of granting anyone their deepest desires. However, Sidorovich and other stalker groups are still carving a path to the center, but a powerful psionic device known as the Brain Scorcher that fries the brain of anyone who tries to get close is still up and active. If the Marked One truly wants to kill Straylock, he'll need to disable the Brain Scorcher and venture into the center of the zone in order to complete his mission. In order to do this, however, players will need to retrieve classified documents from a military base. The marked one ventures to the Agriprom area where the base lies, but an attack by the military disrupts his plans. 
After helping push back the invading military forces, a stalker known as Mole guides the Marked One to an underground area in order to both reach the military base and find Strelek's secret hideout within the underground labyrinth. After obtaining the documents, the Marked One arrives at the duty bar, 100 rats, and with the assistance of the barkeep, uncovers the location of a laboratory called X-18. Inside, players are confronted with the iconic Snorks, mutated soldiers that now roam the wastes of the zone. Documents found inside reveal that the lab was used to conduct experiments on psionic emissions and was promptly abandoned after mutated test subjects overran the facility. The Marked One falls unconscious and has a vision of Strelok standing before the sarcophagus, the destroyed reactor number four housing the mythologized monolith. After waking up, fighting through military forces, and returning to the barkeep, players learn that the brain scorcher protecting the monolith is man-made, and that the documents relating to its creation lie within Lab X-18 in Yantar. After arriving in Yantar, the Marked One meets Professor Sakharov, and after helping him take radiation measurements, gives him a completed sight helmet meant to ward off the effects of any psionic emissions. Both around and inside the building, players encountered zombified stalkers, soldiers, and faction members, turned into mindless drones by the Kamenov emitter within the lab. Venturing inside, the Mart-1 eventually disables the device and once again collapses. This time, he has a vision of Strelok being healed by a man known simply as the Doctor, before deciding to return north to the sarcophagus. If you own The Marked One awakens and discovers the body of Ghost, one of Strelok's men, who arranged to meet with Guide. It is at this point that the story of the game diverges depending on the player's actions. If the players continue on with the Marked Quests, the Marked One will return to the Barkeep before heading to the area known as the Red Forest, a base heavily defended by monolith fanatics who protect the Brain Scorcher inside Lab X-19. The Marked One infiltrates the base, disables the Brain Scorcher, and instigates all-out warfare in the center of the zone. Every faction, every military group, and every mercenary cell heads towards the sarcophagus, either hoping to claim the wish granter for themselves, or to prevent anyone from reaching it. However, with the help of duty, the Mort One pushes forwards against overwhelming hostile forces, manages to get into the sarcophagus, and reach the wish granter. Depending on the player's actions throughout the game, the Marked One receives a variety of endings. I want the, zone to disappear. the positive ending, triggered by positive reputation, faction leaders being alive and under 50,000 rubles, sees the Marked One wishing for the zone to disappear. The monolith instead robs the Marked One of his sight, rendering him completely blind, and in effect, makes the zone disappear. The greedy ending, triggered by having over 50,000 rubles, sees the Marked One wishing to be rich, but is instead given a vision of being rained on by gold before being crushed by falling debris. I want to rule the, world. the ruler ending, triggered by killing both faction leaders, has the Marked One asking to rule the world. The monolith obliges, filling the Marked One with energy before absorbing him into the monolith itself. In effect, ruling the world through man's desire to reach it. I want immortality. The Immortality Ending, triggered by lack of other qualifying criteria, has the Marked One wish for immortality. In an act of sick irony on par with the other wishes, the Marked One turns to metal. The final wish ending is the negative ending, triggered by having a terrible reputation amongst the factions. The Marked One notes that humanity has been corrupted and must be controlled. He stands in darkness, assaulted by visions of nuclear detonations, 
mutants, viruses, and other horrible sights, before standing forever in the darkness of the Aether. All of these various Wish Granter endings are false endings, however. Far cries from the canon true ending of Shadow of Chernobyl. Earlier in the game, if the player returns to Strelok's hideout after disabling the Psy emitter in Lab X-16, the Marked One will meet the Doctor. Here, Doctor will offer a startling revelation to both the player and the Marked One. He is, in fact, Strelok. After investigating the sarcophagus sometime in the past, Strelok lost his memory, and for reasons unknown, began hunting down the memory of himself. Everything you have said about the monolith is true. All of it. It is just an illusion manufactured in a lab next to the sarcophagus. And nobody, nobody who reached the monolith has ever come back. It looks like they have died there. Doc informs Strelok that the Wish Granter is a flytrap, a distraction from something more sinister in nature, and instructs him to investigate the Pripyat Hotel using a decoder that can open a door within the Wish Granter sarcophagus. After this startling revelation, players continue on through the same steps as before, infiltrating the Red Forest, disabling the Brain Scorcher, and fighting through the streets of Pripyat. Strelok once again breaches the interior of the sarcophagus, but instead of approaching the Wish Granter, Players instead find a secret lab underneath the destroyed reactor room. Pushing through the monolith fighters, players make it to the inner sanctum of the secret lab. A holographic entity, referring to itself as the Common Consciousness, or Sea Consciousness for short, an amalgamation of seven volunteers who fuse their minds together, creates Strelok. This higher being claims responsibility for Strelok's amnesia with the purpose of using the Stalker to keep others away from the hidden secret of the Zone. Along with this, the Common Consciousness also reveals the origins of the Zone. Following the Chernobyl disaster of 1986, the Soviet government began using the Exclusion Zone as a base of operations for research on the human mind, focusing primarily on psionics. The team discovered an invisible energy field surrounding the Earth called the New Sphere. This sphere connected human minds and thoughts, leading to this team looking for ways to influence minds on a global scale. This in turn led to the development of the Common Consciousness, wherein seven neurally linked scientists attempted to create a hive mind to control man. After completion of the experiment, a rift in the new sphere allowed it to directly affect the biosphere, creating the altered zone of alienation, when the laws of physics no longer applied. In order to work on fixing the rift in the new sphere, the Sea Consciousness erected the monolith as a distraction, placed the Brain Scorcher in the Red Forest, created the monolith fanatic faction comprised of brainwashed individuals, and unleashed the powerful emissions that come in the form of powerful and unpredictable weather anomalies. And the story plays out from there. Strelok and his group make their way into the sarcophagus. A powerful emission blasts him and his group. He's found by the Sea Consciousness and, not knowing who he is, gives him the task of killing Strelok after wiping his mind, and the Marked One goes on his long journey of self-discovery within the Zone. The Sea Consciousness offers Strelok a choice, become one of the Seven and ensure its survival and continued research into fixing the Rift, or destroy it outright and halt the ongoing experiments. In the end, Strelok destroys the Sea Consciousness, halting the experiments altogether. Suddenly, in a field, the skies above him begin to clear, indicating that the zone has apparently vanished. Ultimately, Strelok is unsure if he made the right choice, but is happy he survived. Shadow of Chernobyl establishes Stalker's unique brand of survival horror. For a vast majority of the story, and for those who never completed the true ending of the game, the entire premise revolves around cosmic horror. The Wish Granter, this anomalous and, at least prior to the true ending, cosmic force pulls stalkers, mercenaries, and military cells alike towards the center of the zone. The Common Consciousness and its experiments reinforce the themes of man's desire, the consequences of man's actions torn with powers far beyond their control and a higher power or energy outside of man's comprehension. 
the barren landscape with decaying foliage and a permanent overcast sky. NPCs often few and far between, the warring factions feuding over the fate of the zone, and the anomalies themselves create a war-torn terraformed location more reminiscent of roadside picnics interpretation of the zone. The anomalies often add an additional cosmic core element as well. Even though the anomalies are a product of a fraction of the new sphere, their properties are no closer to being fully understood. Electros, Rilligigs, Vortexes, Fruit Punches, Burners, and even the powerful emissions themselves present an added danger to the player. Although only two emissions occur in the game, once while taking measurements in Yantar, and once while attempting to enter into the CNPP, their clear effects in the zone are felt through character interactions, and the debilitating effects witness the two times they occur. Shadow of Chernobyl integrates horrifying monstrosities to fight as well. Several different mutant types, some far more supernatural than others, prowl the barren landscape along with the player. Initially, the player encounters mutated wild animals, such as mutated blind dogs, pseudodogs, mutated boars, and mutated pigs referred to as flesh. These initial mutants pose a little to no threat to the player, especially seasoned stalkers. However, the body horror ramps up as the player ventures further into the zone. Down in the depths of the Agriprom underground, players encounter the first of the mutated humans, a mutant capable of turning invisible and attacking the player from any angle, the Blood Sucker. Blood soaked sharp tentacles, a hunched and vaguely humanoid appearance. This creature's glowing eyes are the only indicator of its impending assault. Later on, players encounter a controller, a horribly disfigured human with powerful psionic abilities that allow it to take over the minds of its victims. Down in the decrepit remnants of Lab X-18, stalkers are assaulted by terrifying vaulting mutants known as Snorks. Wearing broken gas masks, crawling on all fours with their pale and decaying skin, their spines completely exposed and letting out terrifying roars. These creatures launch themselves at the player and inflict heavy amounts of damage upon them. A massive creature, mutated beyond recognition, barrels towards the player, an entity known as a pseudo-giant. Finally, before players can ascend from the darkness of X-18, they must contend with electrifying poltergeists and one pyrogeist, psionic mutants capable of conjuring fire and electrical damage, as well as throwing objects at the player. At the bottom of the list, players encounter husks of what used to be stalkers. Subjected to prolonged exposure to powerful psi fields found in Yantar and the Red Forest, these former allied and hostile combatants show no regard for allegiances and attack all those who wander into their path. And although Strelok succeeds in destroying the sea consciousness, the dangers of the zone continue to live on. Stalker, Clear Sky is a prequel to the events of Shadow of Chernobyl. Unlike its predecessor, Clear Sky runs on an updated engine that features more vivid imagery and color, a wider selection of weapons, and a plot revolving around a mercenary named Scar as he works with the Clear Sky faction. This faction, a splinter group of the original research team that inadvertently created the zone in the first place, seeks to study and understand the affected region. Clear Sky enlists the aid of Scar in order to figure out why the zone is increasing in dangerous emissions, eventually learning of Strelak's group reaching the sarcophagus. Clear Sky theorizes the emissions are the zone's defense mechanism, springing into life in order to eradicate what remains of Strelak's group. Eventually, Clear Sky, along with Scar, pushes towards the Chernobyl power plant in order to kill Strelak and bring balance back to the zone. However, the common consciousness notices the invaders and unleashes a powerful emission. In the aftermath, only two members of Clear Sky survive, while all others, Scar included, either die in the emission or become brainwashed servants of the common consciousness.
Clear Sky introduced several new mechanics, as well as radically changed the landscape of the zone in the build-up to Shadow of Chernobyl. A new Faction Wars feature allows the player to join any number of the zone's groups, fight for dominance, and capture points on the map already featured in the first game, and it picks the zone as a well-populated area. This alone drastically changed the desolate, overcast landscape seen in the first entry. A Day-Night Cycle An enhanced trading, PDA and questing weapon and armor upgrade system and a reimagining of the zone are prominent points in the game. On the flip side, hostile NPCs seem to be quite a bit tankier. The old headshot critical damage system seems to have been abandoned, and some strange bugs, oftentimes game-breaking, unfortunately plague the game. Artifacts are also few and far between, with the player able to progress through a bulk of the campaign without encountering a single one. This is a drastic departure from the abundant artifacts littering the zone and shadow of Chernobyl. Clear Sky also features a dynamic music option, but is quite buggy and plays upbeat battle music that drastically changes the tone of the game from a first-person shooter survival horror to more of a first-person survival shooter. While the day-night cycle does add to the creepy elements, the highly populated zone, the Faction Wars feature, and the prominent focus on action set pieces detracts from the horror introduced in the first entry. Call of Pripyat takes place shortly after the events of Shadow of Chernobyl. The state security services launches a military assault in order to take the Chernobyl nuclear power plant following Strelak's deactivation of the Brain Scorcher. However, this Operation Fairway fails with several of the helicopters inexplicably going down in the zone. Major Alexander Dagtyarev, disguised as a new stalker in the region, begins his investigation into the disappearance of the five helicopters. A plethora of side quests are available to the player, a few of them required in order to progress in the story, though the player can choose to ignore many of them. Due to this, the overall story of the game can be completed rather quickly. Unlike Clear Sky, Call of Pripyat chooses to explore entirely new regions of the zone. Even though Pripyat itself does return, it does not feature any familiar locations, seen in either Shadow of Chernobyl or Clear Sky. Only three regions are accessible, though these regions are much larger than the ones featured in previous entries. Dagtyarev explores these regions in order to understand why the helicopters crashed, to further understand the complexities of the zone in the aftermath of the Brain Scorcher's shutdown, and to report back to the evacuation point in Pripyat. Despite these new locations, the same factions, mechanics, anomalies, and hostile mutants appear. Dagtyarev navigates these dangers in a rapidly changing zone, inadvertently helping the residents of the zone in completing his mission. Dagtyarev learns that the powerful emissions that wreak havoc across the zone create new anomalies and destroy old ones, rendering any attempt at mapping them out a futile effort. This in itself is the reason why the helicopters went down. Returning to Pripyat, Dagtyarev helps to dislodge some of the monolith fighters before being approached by Strelok himself, who offers his assistance and knowledge to the military. In the end, the player, along with his new companions, extract from Pripyat. Multiple ending slides provide a variety of different conclusions to the story. The exact canon ending is unknown, but will likely be revealed in the soon-to-be-released Heart of Chernobyl. Kala Pripyat ups the ante on horror. Like with Clear Sky, the day-night cycle returns, plunging players into darkness as they wander around the barren wastes of the zone. All mutants receive updated models, sound effects, and so on, giving them a more lifelike appearance in the updated engine. Snorks. Zombies. Animal mutants. Bloodsuckers. Pseudogiants. And other prominent dangers of the zone return. Along with them, a few new mutants join their ranks. The Bureau, a cut mutant from Shadow of Chernobyl. These entities, short in stature yet incredibly resilient, attack the player with debilitating gravitational attacks. The other new addition is the Chimera, an aggressive, hairless, cat-dog-like creature with incredible speed and powerful attacks. Call of Pripyat lists them as the single most dangerous mutant in all of the zone, and after players encounter them, can begin to understand why. Anomalies while still appearing sporadically in smaller forms, are often traded out for larger regional anomalies. 
the swamp anomalies, the oak pine, the scar, and many more appear as both terraformed locations and hazardous regions capable of injuring, trapping, or outright killing the player. Recurrent emissions, like in clear sky, add an additional element danger of the zone. However, unlike in Shadow of Chernobyl and Clear Sky, wherein emissions were energy buildups as a direct result of the sea consciousness interacting with and controlling the new sphere, the reasons behind this new buildup and release of energy is unclear. It could be explained away as a fractured new sphere in the region, still causing energy buildups and releases. Though with the sea consciousness destroyed, the zone is truly an entity entirely its own. Stalker, Heart of Chernobyl, is considered the true sequel to Shadow of Chernobyl. After years of work, the game saw a tumultuous development cycle, with some of the original GSC Game World members moving on to other companies, some taking their ideas with them to create their own iterations. GSC closed entirely, but later reopened in 2014. By July of 2020, Heart of Chernobyl officially entered into full development, and a year later, the first trailer of the highly anticipated sequel went live. The plot appears to center around a group of scientists attempting to control the zone and make it entirely their own. Updated graphics and mechanics, familiar locations and enemies, and a completely revitalized zone return. Heart of Chernobyl is slated to release in December of 2023. I am blind, but it is you who cannot see. From Roadside Picnic to Tarkovsky's Stalker to GSC Gameworld's Stalker franchise, each iteration of the zone brings unique horrors and science fiction elements to the table. While the exact nature of the zone, its overall purpose, and what is inside of it differs from version to version, many of the science fiction and horror elements have remained consistent despite the vast differences in each version. For this comparison, we'll use a simple Venn diagram to illustrate the similarities and differences between the three different zones. Roadside Picnic Roadside Picnic created the first iteration of the zone. Unlike the other two versions, the zone shares its existence with five others across the globe and was created by an alien visitation in the book's past. The landscape of the zone is described as an abandoned wasteland filled with crumbling buildings. Unlike the other iterations, this version of the zone is barren and lifeless, with no bands of stalkers, bandits, or warring factions to pad out the environment. Instead, the crumbling buildings, a few scattered souls, and the dangers of the zone are all that exist inside. While all versions use some kind of wish granter, this first version uses an artifact like wish granter in the form of the Golden Sphere. This version also appears to actually grant a person's wish, whatever it may be. The stalkers that appear in Roadside Picnic are also primarily artifact hunters that search for the singular artifact known as an empty. They go into the zone, grab valuable empties, and return to the world outside to sell them to the highest bidder. The military also has a high presence in the story, though appears to be less at war with the stalkers. Instead, the military tends to strong-arm stalkers into doing their bidding, such as collecting house slime in order to create WMDs. The government also actively studies the zone, the artifacts, and the anomalies found inside. Lastly, Roadside Picnic leans most heavily into science fiction than any other genre. Tarkovsky's Stalker takes the most liberties with the source material. This iteration of the zone, lush and filled to the brim with flora and fauna, originated from a meteor crash alluded to be more than simply a meteor. Originally, Tarkovsky planned on shooting in a more barren desert environment the later shifted to filming in a more lush and abandoned region. While Stalker does share the abandoned and quarantined aesthetic of its source material, the vibrant green flora depicts a zone in stark contrast to what the Strugatsky brothers depicted. The anomalies of the zone are depicted far less, and the violence of the zone is only alluded to rather than outright shown. As for shown, artifacts are completely absent from the film, as well as the subplots involving them. The Stalker even goes so far as to demand the writer not touch nor take anything from the zone, lest they suffer its wrath. Inside the zone, the roles of Stalkers are different from the source material. 
With no artifacts to hunt and sell, stalkers instead act as guides for individuals wanting to explore and study the zone, and for those wanting to reach the Wishing Room. The Wishing Room, in and of itself, while an adaptation of the Wishing Sphere, plays a different role in the film. Rather than granting wishes, it instead brings to life the Wisher's deepest secret desire. The room and the zone itself act as a religious allegory, as a matter of faith for the Stalker and those he attempts to guide to it. Due to this, Stalker shifts away from science fiction and instead veers towards more cosmic and supernatural elements, focusing on developing a philosophical and introspective analysis of the three main characters. While the Stalker film deviates quite heavily from the source material and draws only a few points of inspiration for the film, the Stalker video game series expands upon and builds upon the original story introduced by the Strugatsky brothers. The zone as it is depicted in Shadow of Chernobyl is the closest visual and aesthetic adaptation of the quarantined area to date. As with the book, Stalker features a mostly barren and abandoned zone. Emissions, anomalies, and radiation have ravaged the area leaving it in a broken state. The artifact market is a crucial point in the game as well as in the book, though a wider array of artifact types and purposes appears in the game. Anomalies litter the zone, and the violence introduced in the source material remains. However, outside of the Wish Granter, the Stalker subculture, and the horror and science fiction elements, GSC Gameworld's iteration of the zone takes on a life of its own. Dangerous mutants, products of the ruptured new sphere and the sea consciousness's interference, roam the wastelands, adding another level of danger. Humans and animals alike have been transformed into creatures beyond recognition. Large groups of stalkers, forming their own factions and warring for dominance, band together to fight back or free the dangers of the zone. And most horrifying of all, the zone itself is a threat, rather than an isolated region of intrigue with its growing size threatening to consume the entire world in its borders. Like with Tarkovsky's Stalker, GSC's Stalker is similarly set in Eastern Europe, inside the Chernobyl Exclusion Zone specifically. This adds in radiation as an additional hazard for players to watch out for. While the Chernobyl nuclear power plant explosion was an unfortunate accident, the zone's creation in this iteration is similarly a man-made catastrophe. No meteors, no alien visitors, just humans toying with powers far beyond their understanding and suffering the consequences. The Sea Consciousness itself acts as an overarching villain, at least in the first title, before the living zone and the bending laws of nature and wildlife take over. The fact that humanity is behind the zone's creation also points towards the other unique characteristics present in this version. Due to the ruptured new sphere, emissions wreak havoc across the zone. Additionally, the psionic emitters and the emphasis of telepathy recontextualizes the science fiction elements present in the game as less otherworldly and more the result of runaway science. The creation of anomaly detectors, of protective hazmat suits, the use of bolts as rudimentary anomaly detectors, and bionic exoskeletons add an additional science fiction elements. Along with science fiction, the game leads into the horror aspect of the game series, especially in Shadow of Chernobyl, and more so in Golem Pripyat. Strelok himself differs from both Rad and the Stalker, becoming a resident of the zone rather than a visitor. His aims are originally for selfish gains, though after his memory wipe, appears to take on a more altruistic route, destroying the zone to protect the world. In doing so, he kills the Sea Consciousness and destroys its flytrap, the Monolith. This also marks the first time that destroying the zone is an option, and a plot point in an iteration. In this iteration, the wish granter is entirely an illusion. It does not grant a wish nor pulls out the wisher's secret desires. Instead, it punishes those who reached it with ironic gifts, blindness, death, and absorption, all twisted results of the wisher's desire. While all three versions take their own liberties with the zone, each story shares its wealth of similarities as well. Let's start with Roadside Picnic and its first adaptation, Stalker. Both feature zones that are relatively unoccupied and abandoned. No groups live within the zone, but rather make treks into it for differing reasons. Stalker also adapts the first, though mostly the fourth and final part of Roadside Picnic, 
wherein the protagonist head towards the Wish Grunter. The Stalker's also a version of the book's protagonist Red, with both a wife and a mutant child nicknamed Monkey, though their individual attitudes towards the Zone differ. Each version of the protagonist grows disillusioned with the Zone, the Wish Grunter and the Meat Grinder that protects it, and their place in the world. Red wishing for something good within him while obsessing over happiness for mankind, and the Stalker's disappointment at the writer and professor's disbelief in the power and majesty of the Zone. Roadside Picnic and Stalker share a wider number of thematic similarities, such as leaning heavily into science fiction and horror elements. Each version features a hefty amount of violence and horror that is noticeably absent in Tarkovsky's version. Both versions also have artifacts as a driving force for a large number of Stalkers. Groups and individuals attempt to find and sell them off for personal gain. Both iterations of a scientific faction wanting to study the Zone in hopes of using their discoveries to better mankind or to combat the Zone. Both versions of the Zone are wastelands ravaged by anomalies, various hazards and dangers, and feature crumbling infrastructure. Lastly, both versions feature zombies to varying degrees. Roadside picnics are traditional undead zombies, though are harmless, while stalkers are brainwashed victims who are highly hostile. Tarkovsky's Stalker and GSC Gamerald Stalker share a great deal of commonalities. First, while the depicted zones are almost diametrically opposed in design, both take place in an Eastern European setting and appear to be the only zone in existence. Telepathic and psionic abilities are also utilized through the mutated child monkey and through the psi emitters and telepathic mutants that prowl GSC's wasteland. Atomic powers are also featured in both. Tarkovsky intentionally focuses on a nuclear power plant in this film, with the video game taking place in the Chernobyl exclusion zone, hinting towards the debilitating effects of nuclear powers gone awry and the consequences of man toying with powers beyond its control in each. Both iterations feature an oblivious and ignorant military. In the film, the Stalker mentions how the military refuses to go into the zone out of fear, highlighting its ignorance and unwillingness to understand it. In the game, the military, while present in the zone, has clear misconceptions on how it works. It took an in-depth investigation by Major Degtyarev and assistance from Strelok to understand how emissions work when zone-based scientists and factions had already figured it out. On the topic of Strelok, both versions have an unnamed protagonist as the lead character, and while players find out Strelok's true identity later on, for a bulk of the game, he goes simply as Marked One, or Stalker, the same as Stalker's protagonist. Lastly, both versions have the Wish Granter as nothing more than an illusion or an impossible tool. The film's Wish Granter, The Room, cannot truly be used in a traditional sense. While it will grant a person's wish, it will only grant the person's innermost secret desire, not what they may have wanted to wish for. Due to this, the room becomes a red herring, a tool to bring out the wisher's truest desire, and reveals the truest version of themselves. The monolith in the video games acts similarly, though it doesn't actually grant the user's wish. It is instead a literal illusion, a device that does not actually exist, but is instead a trap, meant to lure in and kill stalkers. Whatever wish it may grant will only bring about the wisher's downfall. Despite the different interpretations, each iteration carries the same core elements of the zone. To start, each version simply has a zone. The origin for each differs, from alien visitations, to divine meteoric intervention, to man-made catastrophes. Each attracts stalkers into its borders. All zones feature a decay of some kind, primarily in the form of structural decay, but also contains elements of societal and environmental decay as well. Another similarity is the presence of stalkers in the region. While the book and the video game stalkers hunt for artifacts and for the wish granter, the film stalkers are simply guides for intrepid explorers. Each version uses a wish granter as a core plot device. The wishing or golden sphere, the room, and the monolith all serve as tools for revealing characters' inner true self and provide commentary on man's desire and penchant for self-destruction. Lastly, each version uses mutants to a different degree. The book and the film have mutants as byproducts of ventures into the zone, appearing as the offspring of intrepid explorers. The game takes an entirely different approach. 
While there are references to children being born with mutations, the vast majority of mutations are the result of either seek consciousness creation and experimentation, or from exposure to the elements of this anomalous zone. Mutated animals, humans, and monsters far removed from the natural ecosystem inhabit the region, attacking and killing careless stalkers. And given the trailers for Heart of Chernobyl, these horrifying monstrosities will continue to lurk in the darkest corners of the zone. The Strugatsky Brothers' Roadside Picnic spawned an entire subgenre of video games, television, and film, and survival horror still prominent today. Outside of the Stalker franchise, many other video games also found inspiration from the original science fiction story, as well as the Stalker franchise itself. Metro 2033, a Russian post apocalyptic fiction novel by Dmitry Glukovsky, was loosely inspired by the 1972 story. Set in a post apocalyptic Russia, where the protagonist Archeum lives in the underground metro of Moscow, contends with horrifying mutants, warring factions vying for dominance, and the supernatural Dark Ones pulling him towards the epicenter of a nuclear blast. Other video games like Escape from Tarkov, wherein the name of the fictional location itself is based upon Andrei Tarkovsky's name, utilizes many of the mechanics and plot points present in the Stalker franchise. The game is a hardcore survival shooter, uses a more complex eluding system based on Stalkers, features weapon and armor customizations, differing ammo types, an elaborate questing and trading system, and is set in a quarantine zone known as the Norvinsk Special Economic Zone. More direct adaptations and inspirations come in the form of Cerverium, Chernobylite, Into the Radius, The Final Station, and many others. Cerverium was a free-to-play online first-person shooter. Although it was developed with elements of Stalker and Roadside Picnic in mind, the game itself is separate from the Stalker franchise. Vostok Game, founded by former GSC Gameworld employees, shut down its servers on May 31st, 2022, due to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Chernobylite is similarly a survival shooter game that takes place in the Chernobyl Exclusion Zone. Players take control of a physicist as he traverses through a hostile zone in search of his missing fiance. The game features similar mechanics to Stalker, and as a character interacting with the Chernobylite element that spurs on supernatural occurrences. Into the Radius is a VR survival shooter available on Steam. The game is often described as Stalker in VR, and it takes many elements from both the game franchise and the book. Anomalies, supernatural dangers, and the zone itself make appearances in this adaptation. The final station utilizes elements of both Roadside Picnic and Neon Genesis Evangelion. The game takes place 106 years after an alien catastrophe known as the First Visitation. However, as the game begins, the second visitation occurs, plunging the world into chaos. Players duly care for the survivors they've rescued and fight at train stations they stop at along the way. Many other games took inspiration from Roadside Picnic, from Tarkovsky's Stalker, and from GSC Gameworld's Stalker franchise, but I only have so much time. If you're interested in finding games similar to Stalker, many helpful guides, forums, and Wikipedia articles can point you in the right direction. Somewhere in the world lies a zone of alienation. Inside, horrifying mutants, dangerous anomalies, alluring otherworldly artifacts, and the siren song of an object capable of granting a person's deepest desires, greet those brave enough or foolish enough to traverse this altered state of reality. Players return again and again, braving the nightmarish bloodsuckers and chimeras, avoiding the whirligigs and vortexes, all in an effort to cash in on the lucrative artifact market, and to be the first to reach the mythical witch granter at the center of the zone. Roadside Picnic spurred on an entire subgenre of books, film, music, video games, and other media in the many years since its release. Even today, adaptations of Roadside Picnic are still being pitched, and television shows and films are still taking inspiration from the core concept. Tarkovsky's Stalker, becoming the first surviving adaptation of the book, is considered a cult classic and one of the most important and influential science fiction films in history. GSC Gameworld's Stalker franchise developed a loyal fanbase, 
cementing its place as a cult classic game in the wake of its publication. And later this year, Stalker 2, Heart of Chernobyl, will hopefully allow players to return to the horrifying landscape of The Zone.